I'm, I'm high treason. And today I think it's time we took a look at a lesser known laptop from Zenith Data Systems. I never looked at any portable technology on here, so this could be interesting or it could be completely fucking boring. Uh, no idea until I try, really, do I? And I'm going to forewarn you, uh, I'm going to be pronouncing the model Slim Sport, because that's how I've always pronounced it. And if I don't, it's going to make my dialogue just sound awkward. So I'd rather just keep saying it wrong than have to stop and say it awkwardly every time. So, yeah, if that's going to annoy you, then you're probably going to want to skip this one. It hopefully it doesn't annoy anyone. That's, that's just how I say it. Before we look at the laptop properly, I feel like I should say a bit about Zenith Data Systems. As sadly, the brand seems to have disappeared, at least where I am and in this corner of the market. So it's possible you've never actually heard of them. Though the parent company, Zenith Electronics, does still exist and they'll turn 100 years old in 2018, as far as I can tell anyway. They're now owned by LG. If you're one of those weirdos who likes valve radios, there's nothing wrong with that, I might add. You might know the name, and yeah, that is the same Zenith, and that's where they got started out, making radio equipment. They're credited with making the first portable radio. They also made televisions and have a history of innovations long enough that I don't really feel like putting it here, because I would be here until Christmas. In 1979, having seen the potential for the computer market, Zenith purchased Heath, who were well known for selling electronics kits including the famous Heathkit H8, a computer kit based on the Z80 microprocessor. It sold very well in the late 1970s. Zenith even sold, uh, Zenith even sold Heath's H89, pre-assembled as the Z89. They soon realised that the Z80 and PDP-11 architectures were a bit of a dead end though, and they began playing with Intel's 8088, much like IBM had done at that time. Fast forward towards the end of the 1980s and circa 1988, oh god damn it. Hey, what's that about the 80s? Hey, computing was awesome back in the 80s, you know. It was better than it is now. We used to have these machines, you call them a portable, right? Or like this one, they're really good. You could like carry them around with you and stuff. Like, it was like a workout when you were in the gym. You know, you got that one there, you're like, oh, yeah. No, the ladies can't resist a guy who's been working out, no? More than can be said for you, you pathetic little... Those little flat square things I've seen you carry around, they're crap! What an idiot. Anyways, Zenith introduced the Super Sport laptops, which would be one of the first major purchases of laptops by a government entity, none other than the US military. The Super Sport was a 286 system and had stackable batteries as well as a very, very good screen, uh, at least as good as passive matrix screens could be. As well as the US military, they were also used by British Telecom, the major telecommunications provider in the United Kingdom. Somewhere around this time, the Slim Sport was introduced. It features a more modern clamshell design. You can probably thank Zenith for your new one to some extent. These were certainly a very early attempt at this. Note how the hinges of the screen are right at the back of the laptop. Now if you look at my T1200XE, which the Zenith replaced, you can see how most systems at the time still had a bulky battery and hard drive behind the monitor. Zenith's system is also very light, at only around 8 pounds. With battery loaded, it's actually lighter than my Dell XPS, though most of the weight of the Dell is probably dirt and duct tape. Oh, as well as huge amounts of solder that I've had to put in there just to keep the thing going. This laptop has a really useful feature. It's simple, but when the hell did this common convenience go out of fashion? Look at that! Mullet Man can now carry his laptop without case to his place of work. Which is probably the parking lot where he sells voyeur videotapes of women that go to his gym. Either way, this feature is useful if you have to leave the case and take the laptop with you. Many portables from this time period had handles like this, and I might start a petition to have them put back, even though petitions amount to absolutely nothing. Because I kid you not, I would gladly pay another dollar or two just to have a handle like this. Note how there are small feet on the back, so you can actually sit the laptop down that way when it's closed without it falling over as easily. 
It's little things like that that count in my mind. The thing is, they didn't spare expense on this thing as far as build quality goes. I mean, look at this thing. You wouldn't think I used to drag it to work where it got stood on, dropped and hit with things repeatedly. This thing has worked its ass off and been abused, and there's hardly a mark on it aside from the missing screws. At the back, there are several ports. One interesting feature is the VGA port, and you probably think, well, that's VGA, everybody has VGA. And yeah, whilst you usually did have a monitor output on your laptop already, many at the time, especially in the $3,500 price range the Slim Sport was in, still only had CGA or EGA graphics on board. The more expensive T1200 XE I used to own had CGA. This is full fat VGA as well on this laptop though, it's not a joke. It does everything a 256k VGA card could be expected to do. I won't be able to show you the chip, but I know for a fact that it's a Cirrus Logic 600 series. It's a two chip solution in the form of a GD610 and a GD620. This is actually a very good VGA chipset, and Cirrus were known for making decent chips at this time. The obligatory serial port is there. It's useful for connecting to all kinds of things. I use it with a null modem cable for interlink purposes, but at work it saw heavy use for configuring network hardware via RS-232 or debugging other machines. Parallel port is also available, and it does exactly what you'd expect it to. This includes connecting it to a Curvox. This small socket is for an external floppy drive. This unit was available in all four of the common sizes. Next to it is a very interesting port. I'd like to know if you know the name of this connector because I'd like a cable to fit it. This port was intended to connect to a box. This box is called an expansion chassis, which allows you to install three ISA cards for use with the laptop. Yeah, no shit, the manual actually says this, and I know it exists. This is a real thing. It even gives us the pinouts for that socket in the manual. Imagine if you could do that now with PCI Express. Hmm, I'd like a new GeForce 790 Ti, but I've only got a laptop. Now wouldn't that be fucking awesome? Uh, I sure as hell hope the 790 Ti is the latest and greatest graphics card from NVIDIA at this time, or I'm going to look very, very outdated. Maybe I should add this feature to that petition, because if I was buying a performance laptop, I'd actually pay for this. I'd even be happy if you stripped other features off the laptop to afford putting this interface in, just so I could install my own expansion cards. It would be absolutely brilliant. I can't help but wonder how a SCSI card would perform in that expansion chassis, though. Another thing, and I'm not making this up, the manual tells us to do this, is the dust cover, and that's great anyway. Actually, it would be more useful now, because laptops have fans and these open USB ports which are just dust magnets. But whatever, I'm not going down that road again. No, the metal hinges, these are here for a reason. They are designed to take the weight of the entire laptop, as you can actually flip the dust cover down underneath the laptop to angle the whole laptop forward for ergonomic reasons. As I said before, it's always the little things that count, and it sits very firmly on this, giving me further confidence in the quality of Zenith's engineering here. Around the corner is a 1.44 megabyte floppy drive. This isn't the original floppy drive. The original one died around a decade ago, and it had always been shaky due to seriously bad repairs by the previous owner. The head was completely mangled. Back then, the hard drive was pretty much dead, and the floppy drive just fell apart while the machine wasn't even being used after its last act had been failing to read any floppies at all. You heard right, this laptop's been out of commission for 9 or 10 years. The front shows nothing remarkable, literally nothing. That's probably a good thing. Zenith could have trolled users by putting a bunch of shitty buttons there that are hardwired to the mouse pad and can't be disabled, causing music to play when you're writing scripts in Word. Front shows nothing remarkable, literally nothing. It's probably a good thing. Zenith could have trolled users by putting a bunch of shitty buttons there that are... What the... Fetish porn videos to start when you're at your mother's house, and the volume to mute when you're watching TV programs you downloaded illegally. The hell? But they didn't. 
Bloody ghosts in the machine. Unlike certain other companies I can think of, the left hand side of the laptop houses the murder. This is removable and mine came with a blank plate over the murder. I have to be honest, this murder appears to be non-functioning now. So its journey across the internet ended somewhere in 2005. It did used to send the DTMF turns to the internal speaker when it was working. There is a vent beneath where the power circuitry is located inside, next to which is the power switch. This is a nice hard switch that you have to flick. It's recessed and it resists being moved just enough that you'd be hard pressed to turn the system on or off by accident, even if you dropped it. Underneath are a bunch of labels, my favourite being FCCID, IFO Cobra. That sounds like some kind of military aircraft that you would use to blow up terrorists. I like the FCC ID. The holes for the internal speaker are located near the front of the laptop, as well as a small cover. If this was intentional, Zenith designers were thinking decades into the future when they came up with this cover. That small cover is over a compartment which contains the CMOS battery. If that battery was to start leaking, it would be very unlikely to damage the internal circuitry if the laptop was stored correctly. It needs replacing, so I should probably remove it. Hey, I can actually change the CMOS battery without dismantling the entire machine. That's never occurred to me before, and that much was almost certainly intentional. Again, it's the little things that count. I don't know why this bit in the centre is solid metal, I have no idea. The rubber feet have also survived, and they don't show signs of giving up on life just yet. Well, that's enough of that, let's open the laptop up. This is done by sliding a latch at either side of the screen. These are still intact. The first thing that hits you is... Actually, how much this thing smells like mould? This is really disgusting, in the same league as the hooker, for sure. Once you've gotten over the smell, it hits you that the screen is huge. It really is for the time. A lot of laptops had much smaller screens than this. It's a backlit passive matrix, true monochrome display. And when I say true monochrome, I mean it's black and white. A lot of displays at the time, such as the one in the Toshiba I mentioned, were other colours, such as blue and white. I won't take it apart, but this is a tough screen. It's surrounded by a metal frame and has a metal plate across the back. You would have to really try if you wanted to break it. The keyboard is a nice layout. It has dedicated cursor keys. There are several shortcuts and functions, mostly via the FN key. One is especially useful, and I'll talk about it later. The battery is under this door. The door opens with a flick of a switch. Another flick in the opposite direction will eject the battery. I'd like to add, before somebody asks, it's pretty much impossible to damage the screen with that because, if you notice, it's going to touch the plastic there. That was the only thing I would ever show concern about, but to be honest, it's not really very likely to touch that. Once you close the screen, it's just going to fall over. Zenith claimed that this battery was capable of running the laptop for over two hours. Given what I've seen, I actually believe that once upon a time, it probably did. If we take the lid off, there's a gap in the sheaf of the HT cables for the screen backlight. That's probably not a good thing. The floppy drive is on the right hand side. And a heatsink for the power supply is on the left, which is underneath the vent that was on the plastic casing near the battery cover. And it's over the vent we noted in the side of the laptop. This actually gets quite hot sometimes. The keyboard is held in with screws, and beneath it is the hard drive. This laptop uses a standard 44-pin IDE hard drive. I've replaced that with a slightly faulty 4GB compact flash card. The laptop can actually be made to see all 4GB with drive overlay software, but I've limited it to only 500 megabytes as it's not really reliable. The laptop came with a 21 megabyte Connor hard drive. Bloody hell! This hard drive got CP on it. It's actually the exact same one Toshiba were using at this time, and probably other companies as well. There's a weird header near the RAM, which I think is for a memory expansion. I'd love to find one of these. 
The laptop has one megabyte on board, so 384k can be used as EMS memory with 640k base memory. No XMS is available like this, unfortunately. You can set the base memory to 256, 512 or 640k and set higher or lower values for EMS memory based upon this as you can't exceed the 1 megabyte limit with the internal memory only. Under this copper shield is the BIOS and CPU. Notice how these are behind little flaps in the copper that lift up. Once again it appears Zenith were really thinking about the technician when they designed this thing. That CPU is a 16 MHz 286 from AMD. It's quite a bruiser then as far as 286s go. The fastest model ever produced was a Harris 25 MHz model, but very little software that was designed for a 286 will benefit from it. You'd probably do better to get a 386. In fact, I've never encountered a system that used one of those. I've never even heard of one, although they must have existed. I'd guess they were probably for industrial applications or something. My desktop 286 wouldn't want to get in scrap with this laptop, because it'd probably lose. It's only rated at 8 MHz, and I run it at 6. The motherboard tops out at 10. The laptop doesn't have a socket for an FPU though. This CPU then is faster than the 12 MHz 286 in both its bigger brother the Super Sport and Toshiba's T1200 XE. At the time, many people would have still been quite grateful to have this kind of power in a desktop. Never mind a laptop. Oh well, let's turn the laptop on, seeing as I don't have that effect on women, and I certainly can't get them to sit in my lap. That switch makes a nice satisfying click to let you know you're doing the right thing, and you can feel the power. power! In all honesty, it's not that easy. The hard drive controller takes a long time to wake up, and sometimes the screen needs to warm up before you can see anything. So it starts out all white, shows desync signal, and then it'll turn black before it starts lightening up with synchronization intact. It's getting better with time, so I assume it's probably just a bit sticky. A bit reluctant to start twisting crystals in the screen again after it had been sat for so long. I rather like how you can actually see the traces in the edge of the screen. The picture isn't bad at all anyway. The BIOS setup is simple enough. It looks like any other laptop from this era, really has separate settings for all three modes, those being AC power, expansion chassis and battery power. You can make it save energy in battery mode this way, but just burn through it when the power cube's connected. That's what the manual calls this black cinder block. The drive controller will work eventually, and I'm quite certain I can fix the problem anyway, so I won't be finding new screws just yet, because I'm going to have to go in there and recap the motherboard. Yeah, I figured that might be the problem, and one of them exploded when I plugged in the interlink cable, so I have a horrible feeling that this is going to be consuming quite a bit of my time. If you hold escape down when powering the system up, you can start the MFM200 monitor, which is located in the laptop's internal ROM. This is really useful, but we'll elaborate on it later. The system can boot very quickly, and it'll usually run DOS, Zenith had their own OEM version of MS-DOS 3.3, which I do have. But I use MS-DOS 6.22 here for compatibility's sake. Now, that monitor, if you're using the right MS-DOS version, you can press Ctrl alt insert at any time, and the machine will restart and kick you out into the MFM200 monitor. In the monitor, you can test the machine, access the CMOS setup, display a colour bar, or order the system to boot from any drive that's connected. You can also assemble or disassemble programs and tamper with things in memory from here. There's also a decent testing facility if you wish to test things out in the laptop. More interesting is Control alt enter which suspends whatever you're running and it just lets you screw around with registers. I don't recommend playing with this if you don't know what you're doing. More interesting, really, I suppose, is Control enter which suspends whatever you're running and lets you screw around with registers. I don't recommend pressing this if you don't know what you're doing, but typing G and then hitting return will just let you go back to wherever you were. 
Control P will echo any text on the screen out to the printer, which is useful for debugging and something I used a lot when I was configuring networks and debugging servers via the serial port, as really it was quite annoying having to write everything down. The laptop can run under Windows 2.11. The laptop is capable of running Windows 2.11, and it does here. It would be possible to run a non-work groups version of Windows 3.11 with the memory expansion installed, though it would be a little limited with the 286 processor. This thing has VGA, so let's test it. I promised I'd run Vector Demo, so I'll run it on medium settings. Well, that seems to work pretty well, doesn't it? What about that passive matrix display though? Yeah, it's not so good on that. This isn't specific to this laptop, it's just the limit of that technology. The newer LCD screens are built with more complicated active matrix thin film transistor technology. You'd probably call it TFT, and it wouldn't surprise me if they'd replace that by now. These screens did exist at the time, as far as I know, but they were very expensive, weighed considerably more, and required very complicated driver circuitry that would have just killed the battery, and they were really cost prohibitive. <laughs> The alternative at the time to LCDs was the heavy gas plasma display. These are the orange displays you'd see in older machines. The plasma technology had a much faster response time. It was comparable to CRT monitors with good driver circuitry. But again, it had its own problems, and they smell funny for some reason. According to the manual, this screen can display 32 shades of grey, which is good. It's certainly better than 50 shades of grey. Or I assume so, given that I've not read that book and don't plan to. From what I heard, it sounds like an erotic fan fiction written by a 13 year old. The screen doesn't know, so I like the screen. Showing gradients on it would certainly back up that it's a fairly capable display panel within the expected limitations. In NSSI, the system scores pretty decently. Actually, it's nipping on the toes of a 386SX. Okay, I'll stop doing that. I can't speak for the emulated FPU as there's nothing comparable in the chart. It's probably just as awful as any other 286 at that. Top Bench yields a respectable score too. It's faster than some 286s that have a 486 SLC or DLC upgrade, apparently, though there are also comparable 286s in the list. If you like setting yourself a challenge, you can install some games. Duke Nukem is no longer sunburn, is black instead. Of course it plays, the screen adds a new challenge, as you can't see enemies and hazards until you're right on top of them. There's really an art to gaming on these screens. Commander Keen runs too, the EGA version's very smooth. I'd like to point out that the uh, blood red colour you're getting, which is getting worse, is not the case on the actual monitor, so I don't know what exactly is happening here, but yeah, I figured I'd better point that out. That isn't really a problem. It's getting worse though, so I'm going to turn the game off before we blow something up. And the problem's gone away. So I don't know, I guess my capture gear doesn't like the video mode. Duke Nukem 2 I found to be quite inefficient on older computers, but it does run okay on this one. Wish I had that expansion chassis, I could put a sound blaster in here and be really obnoxious. The internal speaker's pretty loud though, not to the point of being offensive, just to the point of being satisfyingly obnoxious. Now I'm going to show you a magic trick. How old is your laptop? How well is that battery holding up? If it's older than five years old, that battery probably doesn't work so great anymore. And if it's older than ten, there's a good chance it's just wasting electricity if you're connecting it. So it probably isn't holding any charge by now. Well, this thing's still equipped with its original battery. And what do you expect will happen then if I remove the power cord while the laptop's running 3D bench? Well, it might slow down a little bit if the system tries to lower the clock speed to save power, but that's about the extent of it. Look, mommy, no wires! 
I ran this machine for a solid 45 minutes before the battery alarm went off. And I was not being conservative with electricity at all. This is not the performance you would expect from a battery that has been around for more than a quarter of a century. Yet here it is, it's still working. Modern laptops use supposedly better lithium ion and lithium polymer batteries, whereas these are very old nickel cadmium cells. It's interesting to note that by law I can't even buy these in my country anymore unless they're explicitly for replacement purposes or medical equipments. This is related to the environmental impact of the cadmium, part of the same law that forced me to use lead-free solder, which contained tin, copper and copious amounts of cadmium, instead of good tin lead 6040 solder. Yeah, enjoy your tin whiskers, assholes, because I've still got a good supply of that. Oh, also power. Well, that's about it for this thing. All I can say otherwise is it does actually score quite well in 3D Bench. I can't run PCP Bench because it needs a 32-bit processor. How annoying. Uh, I can run Wolfenstein 3D on it, though, but that's about your limit for FPS games. You can't run Doom again. Needs a 32-bit processor. So it's not going to happen. I'm not entirely done yet though, what about that manual? Now this is what I call a manual, it has everything you would ever need. Good descriptive graphics where necessary but not all over the place to the point of being bloody annoying, and useful stuff in general, it's certainly better than the manual for that Dell XPS. Okay that's not the original manual that Dell sent with it, but it was pretty much the same. If I have problems setting up the computer, or if it's broken, and I need to troubleshoot it, what if I don't have another one to go on the internet and visit your stupid bloated website? The front has a table of contents. The back has an index, as well as a place to store your CMOS settings in case of battery failure. The rest of the manual tells you everything you're ever going to need to know. Uh, how to set the laptop up, as well as its expansions, what the LEDs are and what they mean, how to organise files on your hard drive, replace a CMOS battery, cleaning procedures in how to exercise the main battery so it lasts longer, just to name some of the things it will tell you. So what is the best bit about the manual? Well, pinouts. Beautiful, beautiful pinouts. Not just that, but technical data like video modes. But those pinouts are exceptionally useful. The other day I wanted to know the pinouts for a regular parallel port on another machine, which of course will be the same, it's a standard interface. Even the proprietary expansion chassis and floppy ports are documented in here. This manual was clearly made with the intention of both novices and technicians being able to use it. I suppose I should quickly note the power brick. It's a hardy piece of kit. It's switch mode too, and some were still linear back then. This lends it a lot of tolerance for voltages and frequencies. You could use this power cube almost anywhere in the world that has electricity, and it will still work. And it'll kick out the 16 volt, and it will kick out the 16 volts the laptop needs to operate. It's capable of supplying double the amount of power this laptop's ever going to need if you want to stress it out. A testament to this thing is the fact that at this point there is a significant increase in current draw by this laptop due to the capacitors inside being absolutely flogged out. It goes without saying that this stuff needs a nice place to live when you're not using it, and the case is the same quality as everything else we've seen here. The material is thick and strong, the handle is sturdy yet comfortable. This long strap can be put over your shoulder, you can also detach that strap if you want to. Once carried documents or software with you, well go ahead, there's a big compartment at the front which is really for the power brick but you can fit other things in there with it if you need to. There's another smaller one at the back. Inside the case is another pouch, it has small sleeves for storing pens or screwdrivers. A velcro strap will hold any files in that you put in there. There are three floppy holders on the front of this, also with their own velcro. They can hold two discs each if you want to force them in, but they're really designed for one each. 
The front of the case proudly displays Zenith's logo. It actually reminds me of the Lad Company logo, used at the start of Blade Runner. I suppose I should point out that size-wise, this whole thing's pretty good. It's thicker than a modern laptop, of course, but it's not too wide and it's not too deep. It's quite comfortable to carry around. I used to cart this thing five or six miles nearly every day, so I should know. In summary, then, this laptop is brilliant. It's quite powerful, extremely well made, and well documented by the company that made it. Exceptionally reliable, it's an all-round hard bastard. It can stand up to a lot of abuse before it'll break down. It has portability, expansion, and usability on its side. That battery is absolutely phenomenal. I don't think Zenith make laptops anymore, and that's sad. Still, its legacy lives on in a few places, because some of the design remains popular, such as the modern clamshell form factor is still in use today. Whilst the older laptops were technically clamshell, starting probably with the grid case, you'll always see the hinges mounted at the back of the case today like the Zenith and not in front of a battery or hard drive like the majority of other portables in this time period. Also, with the processing power and capabilities this laptop has, it could almost be considered a DTR or desktop replacement, a category of laptops which is now recognised to exist. It would have been fairly middle of the road as far as the desktop was concerned at the time, but look at models of laptop like the HP EliteBook that exist today. The disappointingly, these modern equivalents lack expandability to a degree, and you could argue this evolved to USB 3, but really USB is just like today's equivalent of a serial port. The throughput can't be compared to that of a proper expansion slot, and the latency can make it unusable in certain applications. Still though, these have more in common with the Zenith than really what you'd consider say a consumer grade laptop. Well there you go, that is the Zenith Slim Sport and I'll be honest with you, this one has been an absolute pain in the ass to work with, not just because of the ongoing reliability problems with the workstations and whatnot. Uh, the Pentium 3 is pretty reliable but uh, I mean it's, I don't use that to capture. Uh, you know, the Zenith is also exhibiting problems as we know. It's been non-functional for 10 years. You know, it's had no working drives. I haven't been able to use it. And getting it back to any working state at all, it's kind of like reuniting with an old friend or something. It, I used to use it a hell of a lot, that machine, and I used to take it to work. You know, I have completely and utterly hammered it. And at the end of it, it still wants to work. It doesn't have that feeling of dying machine. You get a feeling when a machine's going to pack up, you know, beyond any real reasonable repair. And it doesn't feel like that. It feels like, okay, yes, I'm sick, but I can get out of this. You know, I just need a, a bit of time spending on me. With, you know, they replace these capacitors and you know, I'll get going again, kind of thing. That's the vibe I'm getting. Because it, it seems it wants to work. And so maybe we'll catch up with it when I've done that, you know, briefly at the end of something else. Because uh, I, th I think it's actually a very, very capable machine for its time. There were 386s on the shelves. I think 486 laptops were out, but they wouldn't have been within the price range of that one. You would have had to pay through the nose for one of them. And, you know, a lot of them still didn't have batteries at the time. So that, that is uh, a thing. Anyway, I'm gonna. I, I like to ramble at the end of the video, so you know, uh, I'm pretty much done. But actually, no. The, because of that, I'll do this first because people probably switch off when I'm rambling. So I don't know which machine to look at next. So I'm gonna leave the choice up to you. Uh, if there's a definite winner, I'll go with whatever people have asked for more. Uh, but obviously, we've got laptops left that I want to look at. Uh, we have. Uh, the Dell XPS, which please don't make me do that. I, yeah, I am going to do it, so yeah, I, I don't mind. Though. It's a pain in the ass to do any of them, really, uh, with the way things are now. And uh, you know, so we've got the Dell XPS, or we've got the two mystery ones. We have the little case, which is unbranded, it's just case logic there. Um, and that obviously has a uh, a portable computer of some sort in it, or we have, oh man, I'm going to have to get off my chair to get this one. Yeah. Or we've 
it's got the big case, which is branded, but I can't get it in frame. So I'm not going to tell you, but it's a big case, whatever lives in there, and it's heavy. So which one do you want to see next? It's entirely up to you. At this point, uh, you can force me to do any of them, I suppose. Not really, because I might still just be like, I'm not doing that. I want to do this one first, I might change my mind. But uh, no, uh, you know, unless there's some reason why it's particularly difficult, I'll try and uh, cater to, you know. So, so by all means, suggest to me which one to do next. But yeah, I, th I think that's everything for today. I'm starving anyway, I've got to go and eat some, and I've got the laptop still running over there, and I'm not sure that's a good idea. So, I'm high treason. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you again soon. I'm sure I had some else soon. Oh yeah, synth video, that, that's coming up soon. I've got uh, a couple of songs finished now, so, so I've been working on for quite a while, really. So, so. I've got them done now to a point where I'm probably not going to get them any better. So, yeah, I expect to see that. And obviously flashbacks coming up. At the time of this, I'm delayed on it again, aren't I? Why am I delayed on it? Oh, yeah, internet went out. And then I just forgot, because I got sidetracked. So I apologise for that. But, yeah, like I said, by all means, uh, if you want to suggest which machine I should do first, obviously you don't know what two out of three of them are. Um, yeah, let me know. And there may be another one joining the ranks soon because I've decided to fix something else. And uh, well, we might just get that on the go if I do. And then maybe we'll have to look at it. It's another portable system, so yeah, who knows? Uh, yeah, I'm my treason. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again soon. Well, the big case might not be happening. I needed to actually have this thing out to film something in here. Uh, that is relevant to the other video. Obviously it's a gas plasma display. Yes, I know you're not happy. God, you have been nothing but a pain in the ass to get going. Um, and apparently it's just killed its memory. And I have another machine that takes the same memory and I have not been able to get it anywhere and I've been looking for it for years. So, yeah, that, this might not happen. Oh, apparently it's working now. Well, I don't know what's going on. Memory size invalid. Is it really? Well, we're going to have a lot of fucking good trying to start up on that, aren't we?